This is an interview for the oral history program at the Institute for Latino Studies in collaboration with the Jose E. Fernandez Caribbean Initiative at the University of Notre Dame. The date is October 9, 2006. We are in room 208 of McKenna Hall on the University of Notre Dame campus. The interviewers will be Maricel Moreno and Ruben Rios Avila. We will be interviewing Rita Indiana Hernandez. Thank you, Rita, for participating in our oral history program. Will you please state your full name, date, and place of birth? Okay. My name is Rita Indiana Hernandez Sanchez, and I was born in Santo Domingo, um, June 11th, 1977, uh, last year of Balaguer's 12, 12 years of, of government. And at the Gomez Patino Hospital. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess I will start with my first question. I would like you to tell me a little bit how, about the process of how did you discover reading, the power of reading. So, of reading or writing? Reading? Reading first. Okay. Yeah, then you can. Okay, I was, I had the good luck of. Uh, being born into a family of which had um, famous oradores um, mm -hmm. in the 19th century and in the early 20th century and also the luck of uh, my mom divorced my father that was not a very lucky event but that <laughs> brought me into my grandmother's house um, where there was a huge piano Steinway stain piano because my the sister of my grandmother was a soprano. She's a very famous soprano in the island, and she would give um, singing lessons um, every day. And my two uncles, one is a shrink and the other, one is a psychiatrist and the other is a, a vet. Um, also, it was, a, it's a, it was a very interesting combination of characters. <laughs> and they all, for some reason, tried to um, pushed me into reading and kind of built a, a little um, library for me since since I was a, a very small kid and like I remember my 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 uh, my uncle Tony who is a psychiatrist he would read me when I was three years old four years old he would buy me instead of buying me like Little Red Riding Hood he would buy me the Greek myths and read them to me uh, so I would go to sleep so. You know, those things help, I think. <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> and um, also, I, I went to a very um, strict Catholic school, uh, the one that all my, my uncles uh, went to. And it, it was a very, it was Los Padres Escolapios, it was a, El Colegio Calasanz. It's a very academic, uh, driven um, institution. It's not, the spiritual side is not that strong, <laughs> but mm -hmm. in terms of, um, like, for example, I, that when I went to college, the stuff that we were having on our freshman year, I had been in contact with, with it when I was in 10th grade or 9th grade. You know, it's like, so it was, it was, it helped. I hated it, but, <laughs> but it helped a lot to have that extra push. Where, where did you pick up your excellent English? Cable. <laughs> <laughs> Cable TV? Yeah. No, my father he lived in the States, in Miami, and I went, I, I came here um, every summer, and my, bro my uh, half-brother um, doesn't speak, speak any Spanish, mm -hmm. um, even right now, <laughs> so I had to communicate with him some somehow. And all my cousins that live in uh, the United States would come and visit me. So it was also I had uh, cousins that went to American schools and they would give me their English books. So I learned to read in Spanish and English at the same time. Like I, I learned to read in Spanish at school, but I learned to read English just by trying to figure out what this book's were all about, you know, like my mom would give me a couple of words and then I would have to figure out the whole sentence, so. Would you say, however, that, uh, would you put yourself in the same category as 
writers like Julia Alvarez or Junot Diaz, who are Dominican-born, but whose uh, main language of expression is uh, English. Mm. Uh, would you compare yourself to them, or do you feel different? I think their experience is different because they were, their relationship to, I feel, I feel they feel more comfortable in a way than me in American culture. And because I've, I've definitely, I mean, I have had a very strong influence um, from American pop culture and, and literature and, and high art. Um, but I've always been on the other side. I was raised in the Dominican Republic. I came during the summers and I had friends and family that lived here, but I, always, I was always there. And I, was, I went to Spanish-speaking <laughs> uh, school and... I write in Spanish, and I don't intend uh, writing in English, at least not for now. Mm -hmm. So, Do you want to talk a little bit about um, how you started writing? What, what inspired you sure. at that early beginning? Um, I was in love with my best friend when I was um, 14. She was a girl, and that was pro very problematic. Um, and my, co I forced my cousin uh, into going out with her, and I wrote, I, I had to make her fall in love with him, so I wrote some poems, and I made him give, give them to, to her, and she fell for them. That's like so, the other uh -huh. <laughs> And she fell for them, and um, that's how it started, you know, like I just... Um, out of need, <laughs> basically, mm -hmm. I, you know, out of need and just, you know, you, you have to figure out ways to, of emotional survival and strategies to, to get where you want to get. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I guess that's, that's how, it, how it happened. And actually the first poem, and it's something that is going to happen, all, it's, it's all over my work, is um, sampling and a very tricky way of, of stealing other people's work, which was my first poem, the first poem I wrote. I went to the, we had an encyclopedia in my house, uh, La Encyclopedia Dominicana, and there was one volume that was Dominican poetry, and I opened it randomly, and I found this poem. I don't even remember how it went. It was horrible, probably. And I took one line uh, from that poem, and the, the, other, the next line I, I would make up. And then I would take another line of that poem, and the next line I would make up. So I was mm -hmm. kind of sampling from that and putting my own stuff into it, kind of like DJs do now, mm -hmm. so sample something from another Is that person's how music. you still go about writing your novels? A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't take whole lines, but I might take, you know, a whole concept. Out of here. Yeah. So... One of your reviewers uh, describes you as one of the first Dominican writers who escaped uh, the passion for Trujillo. Mm -hmm. that Trujillo seems to be uh, like a monomaniac <laughs> subject mm -hmm. in Dominican uh, literature. Would you agree with with this guy, or uh, how do you see uh, your work in terms of the Trujillato? Well, I don't. I think it's not that easy to escape the Trujillo. And actually, Papi is like, I was gonna say. you know, it's a, that's what it's all about. Yeah. But it's just that you can talk about Trujillo in a way, and you can do it in another way, and mm -hmm. make it less obvious and rep uh, repetitivo, mm -hmm. you know. And um, I just think. It's very weird because I, I have an, an aunt who is who was uh, one of Trujillo's last um, mistresses. Can you say that? Yeah, mm -hmm. lovers. Mm -hmm. And she's she's always calling me and asking me, when are you going to write the book about my life? So it's kind of like I have that pressure in a very, <laughs> in a very physical <laughs> and like a present uh, way. It's not like abstract so it's but it's you know we, we st I think we still we are still uh, living in a Trujillato so it's mm -hmm. that's what it's all about you know you have mm -hmm. to, it's it's like a permanent it's not even a, un trauma yet it's it's actually the the
present. <laughs> How would you say that the people from your generation respond to Trujillo's presence in Santo Domingo? There's a, there's a few, I mean, there's a lot going on in terms of, of writing right now. And this has just developed like in the last five years. Like a very, like during the 90s, nothing happened at all. And in the, like since the 2000s, like a lot of kids are writing and they're uh, painting and doing performance art. And I think it's, it has a lot to do with maybe Balaguer's death <laughs> or mm -hmm. the internet. I mean, there's a lot of reasons, but there's, there's something that's building up. And not everything is, has a lot of like quality, but there's definitely some, something that's, that's being, algo se está exorcizando de alguna manera y, y, y pienso que es una rebeldía muy concreta y muy eh, enfocada o sea no 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 es tan no son cosas tan dispersas no es un discurso tan disperso es, es una hay a pesar de que no y no parte de la academia o sea son they're mostly like teenagers that hang out you know in the streets or you know just like hanging out and going out to parties or a lot of them I would say 50% of, of, of them are um, queer, um, mm. are doing like really sophisticated work um, mm. in terms of respondiendo a esa, a esa, a esa cultura eh, trujillista en la literatura. Y digo trujillista, aunque fuera antitrujillista, el hecho de estar repitiendo una narrativa constantemente me parece que es a veces peor que, que dejar las cosas <laughs> en un cajón y, y pasar a otro capítulo. Um, ¿Seguimos en español? <laughs> no? Maybe we should keep Go the questions in Spanish, in English. Mm. So. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, just kind of going along the same line, um, do you want to talk a little more about the, um, do you feel part of a specific literary tradition then? Is this something that is booming right now? I mean, where do you place yourself in terms of Dominican literary history? I don't know. Well, when I wrote my first novel, I was 19 years old. I had, I didn't hang out with writers. Um, I had a couple friends who were um, painters or performance artists or people from from uh, theater background but mostly all my references um, were came from popular culture you know and they and I had read a lot but they you if you read my first novel it's like a little bit of a grunge manifesto you know I was like I Kurt Cobain had just died and I it had, I mean, for some, like, maybe you think, like, well, this girl, she's, like, in the Dominican Republic. What the hell does that have to do with Kurt Cobain dying, you know? Mm -hmm. But there was something, there was something that linked us in a way. And I don't know. Uh, maybe just that I wanted to wear flannels and it was too hot <laughs> for me to do that. Uh, but I wore those flannel shirts anyways to go to the mall. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. But, and, and that's, and it's weird, but when people think of a writer and they usually think that your, your maestros are always going to come from literature. Mm -hmm. And I don't um, have any, any uh, Dominican writer, uh, I don't put any Dominican writer on top of, uh, I mean above Luis Diaz, who is a singer-songwriter from from over there, mm -hmm. who I think has produced the best poetry and even prose in his songs, if mm -hmm. you can say that. Mm -hmm. So, tell us about some of your maestras or maestros. Okay. Um, for a long time, um, I was uh, obsessed with the beats, the beatniks, um, mm -hmm. or for many reasons, for uh, my personal interest uh, in psycho, psycho, psychodelia and um, uh, 
estados alternos de la mente mm -hmm. and there I, there's something about William Burroughs in particular which some people don't even put together with the beats but I like to do that because I like all of them <laughs> but mm -hmm. there's something about him him being queer and part of, of, of a movement but you can't really put him in a in a box in any of those boxes because he's just like such a he's so big and so es tan genial y tan enfermo y tan eh, o sea, está por encima de cualquier eh, de cualquier sticker de minoritario que uno quiera eh, colocarle y I love, I mean, just the way that he works with, I was thinking about, like, yesterday when I was on my way here, and I was in the, where they check your, you have to take your shoes off at the airport, and you have to put all your things in little <laughs> bins and all that, and I was just like, this is like, this guy's a total, it's, he's a prophet, you know, he's talking about this borders, this, and, and, and they're all linked to, like, sex and, and, and reproduction and this horrible creatures that are like part ether, part like slimy uh, secreciones and it's, right. it's all, it's what we're leave, like, we're part of this um, biological, um, uh, I don't know, paranoid fantasy, you know, that, that we're living right now and I don't know. Um, Have you felt pressure? in Santo Domingo to be or become a Dominican, a Dominican uh, writer in the, in the nationalist sense of the word? Well, it's, I've never felt, I don't know, I've never felt the pressure because I've never been, I don't hang out with, with people who would put that pressure on me. Maybe like, and if, even if, I mean, if they don't put the pressure on you, they will just, make you a Dominican writer, right. <laughs> you know, like the, either the critics or just the fact that, you know, you asked me where I was born and where, when. So just we start, we started that, this interview with that particular fact, you know, like I could have just said that maybe, yeah, I was born in Indiana, but so <laughs> it's just, <laughs> the pressure is always, it's not even, a, it's not even pressure, it's, it's, it's inevitable, I guess, it's like, It's a little structure fantasy that we have to live with. <laughs> Some people talk about a queer nation. Would you, uh, would you consider yourself related to that quote unquote citizenship uh, of the world? Uh, how do you relate to the queer phenomena in culture? I was, I was hearing um, a monologue the other day, I don't remember uh, the artist's name, but he was saying that it's th very difficult to be part of a community and he was just saying that how can I have something in common with the right-wing uh, closeted homosexual and the homeless transvestite, um, you know, it's like you're But the thing is that you do <laughs> have a lot of things in common. And um, I definitely, if I have to uh, be part of something, I, w I would much rather be part of, a, of that community than to say, you know, I'm a Dominican. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I would mm -hmm. much rather be part of that and be part of that struggle, um, which is more imminent to me and to a lot of other people that are not from my country, are not my age, and are not, um, that have any, nothing to do with me than to be part of something called patria or... Mm -hmm. How would you describe that struggle uh, as it relates to your work and, and who you are? Being queer in the world? Well, um, I think it's something that you don't under you don't understand struggle as struggle <laughs> mm -hmm. um, for a long time you just you know you just do things like I did like you write poems for your cousin so he can and you don't know that you're just being you're you're in this horrible structure that's that you're you can't you know you just 
you're suffering and you're not being you're not being able to live your life like every person should. Um, and you you just you know when you're a teenager you just assume that you just have to you know do whatever you have to do to survive. But so I think the stru struggle is just something that you you realize after a long time after you have some distance from your uh, early experience and you can say well that was struggle <laughs> you know that was <laughs> there was pain there and like then you you can work you can do some there's people that that will never realize that you know and that live in in psychological um, cubicles that are very tough and very restraining and that will live like that forever and have no problems with that so um, the Dominican culture is a very traditional um, culture in terms of uh, of every sexual, <laughs> uh, particularly in terms of sexual values uh, and all that. So I wonder, uh, being a gay writer, uh, how do you feel uh, judged by? Your country, your work, um, how do you handle, how do you negotiate that being queer in a society that tends to look down upon that identity? Well, the thing is that in, in the DR, I'm not like, I was telling someone last night that I, when I, if I go to Puerto Rico and they interview me, and they've done it before, even without interviewing me, they, if they write a piece for the newspaper, they'll say that I'm gay, and I have no problems with that, and no one will have problems mm -hmm. with that. But in the DR, even if I say it, or, you know, everyone, I have no, I, I, I go out with my, with my girlfriend, and everyone knows that I'm gay, but it won't be said like it won't be uh, no one will write about it no one will and I'm not I don't have the need for that I mean I don't I don't want them to to write an article about it I'm just saying that it's, uh, it's a little bit of, a, of an example it signals at, at that kind of uh, playing uh, that we're liberal but you know not that much you know we, we can tolerate you're very talented we can we like what you do but we're not going to go there and it's not that they're respecting my private life it's just that that it's that they're that's you don't go there it's, it's like way. yeah and in, in a very um strong way mm -hmm. in a very like primitive way it's mm -hmm. uh, it's a very it's un, un ejemplo, pero, o sea, de, de verdad cómo funciona un tabú. Y la, mm -hmm. en, y la sociedad dominicana eh, funciona de esa manera no solo con, con la homosexualidad, o sea, con todo. Es, una, es, es un, una hipocresía muy sofisticada. Porque en los altos, o sea, en el, en, incluso en el Palacio Nacional, o sea, hay eh, muchos homosexuales que trabajan directamente con el gobierno y gente que... que eh, trabaja en muchas instituciones de, de mucho poder, de mucha influencia, pero no están fuera del closet. Todo el mundo sabe que, que son gay, pero no se dice, no se habla de eso. Si hay una reunión de la compañía, no va a ir con su pareja. O sea, es como cada cosa en su lugar. Do you feel that your work is affected because of this um, environment that is not necessarily Super welcoming of mm, no, no, I don't think so. You know, limit. It was definitely. I mean, it's definitely affected because I was I was raised there, mm -hmm. and it, it has to be in my work somewhere. But um, I don't definitely don't work thinking about that or thinking about if someone's going to be offended or <laughs> you know. Tell us a little bit about your work in publicity. Uh, was it just a way to make a living, or do you think? At some level, it had something to do with your life as an artist. Um, I took that job because it's a, it's a, in the DR. There's no artist grants. There's no support from the government. There, so if you're an artist and you can't sell your work um, to a level that you can live off it, you have to do something else. And most people, um, there's a lot of. Uh, visual artists, writers, uh, musicians that work in advertising because 
there's good money there and uh, you can do something that's kind of artsy and it's not that boring it's not like you can go with shorts to work and you know it's it's fun um, but it's also very, it drains you because you're working with the same um, uh, tools that you would use to do your own to develop your own projects so you come home and you're not really into writing anymore because you've been writing jingles and commercials all day long so it's it's good in a way uh, I can't say that I mean my work is has definitely been uh, influenced by, by all that and by seeing that culture and seeing how things are sold and seeing how you make a product and see, seeing how what people expect and what people are what people believe you know what people mm -hmm. want to believe and when you what you can make them uh, believe and the whole language it's it was at the beginning it was definitely a very intense um, creative workshop for me to like just come up with with an idea like in 20 minutes because the clients coming and we have to show them something else because we only have one option and we have so in that sense it was good but you're just making crap <laughs> mm -hmm. all oh, like 90 percent of the time you're making crap to sell detergent how is it that you um, came about considering yourself a performer in the broad sense of the, of the word you're not one of those writers who are strictly literary mm -hmm. uh, you, you not only because you do theater but you also do puppet theater uh, and so forth. Uh, tell us about your uh, your role as a performer. Um, since I was a kid, I always I was always doing theater, and well, like I said, like I had a soprano in my house, um, doing doing her vocalizaciones for four hours every afternoon. So that was, and she was the director of the um, Teatro Nacional in the Dominican Republic. So we would go every week. We would go to different plays and different, even when they were for adults, I would go um, to, and companies that would come from Spain and all over Latin America, so I had that, that was very present, and um, I guess I just, uh, at some point, like after my first book, there, there's a point when, in between books that I really don't want to write, and I have all these things that I want to articulate and I don't want to do it through writing because maybe that's I don't feel that's the, the right way and I just come up with some some way to do it and like right now I'm working on this uh, project of a fake documentary about my life with my partner in Harlem and it's kind of anim, anim, an animated movie and also uh, there's puppets there's all the things that I that I've done like put into one um, project so it's, it's kind of like if I feel like one day I'll feel like I want to make a puppet and I'll make the puppet and then maybe I have to write a story for the puppet and then why don't I make a play and then why don't I let's take it to Santo Domingo and show it over there and or or it will be like I, I write a song and I make a an a, a beat uh, on the computer and then I think maybe I should make an animation for this song and so it's Kind of like crochet, what we were talking mm -hmm. about yesterday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Something to do with your hands. <laughs> you also have a blog. Tell us about your blog. Um, I have, I, I have a, I have a blog, and I have a, another. I have a few uh, spaces on the internet, and sometimes I don't put anything on them for months. But it's just, you know, it's a space to put stuff up there that I'm not going to publish or that I'm not going to do anything with, like just. Do you consider yourself um, like a member of a community of bloggers? Or no. Do you, are you related no. to others? <laughs> no, I'm definitely the, related to to a cult, culture that's very internet oriented, mm -hmm. but not a blogger. I have friends who are bloggers, and mm -hmm. I'm not one of them. <laughs> you know, like the typical 24-hour um, blogger that has... I have friends who have office jobs and can stay, like, on their computer all day while they're doing other things and just posting things. It's like a, it's a lifestyle. <laughs> mm -hmm. Which is not yours. No. <laughs> so how do you make that decision regarding what you're going to
put down in the internet and you're not that's it you're not going to work on that anymore versus something that you want to keep working on and perhaps even publish well i think that what i post on, on my page is just um they're little little i don't know little sketches i guess they're There's little songs there yeah little mm -hmm. sketches little something mm -hmm. that you know that were that give you a a, a clue of where I'm at mm -hmm. in that particular hour <laughs> because sometimes I just open the page and I write something right there and post it you know like it's not sometimes I do write I post some like and maybe I'll find something from like a year ago and say hey I'm gonna post this up mm -hmm. so it's it's very random but it's not the same like I'm working in a novel maybe I'll post a, a chapter too, but that usually I don't do that. Let's talk about your two uh, novels. Let's start with uh, La Estrategia de Chochueca. Mm -hmm. Would you tell us a, a little bit about where were you while you were writing uh, this, this this novel in terms of where, where your mind was at and how did it go about? Okay. Um, I was pregnant when I wrote that novel and I had a lot of time <laughs> in my hands. Um, uh, I, I had some sketches I had written while I was parting um, very hard at the end of my De Mi Adolescencia and I took all these sketches and viñetas and kind of made that book like made a and you can you can see it when you when you read it you, you can see that it's very um, frag fragmented and but there's some pieces that were kind of not you don't you don't know if they really go there or if they could <laughs> go somewhere else. Um, I was very young and I just wrote a book. A lot of writers say say this, but I guess it's because it's true that I wanted to read a book that came from a Dominican author or that talked about things that I knew about. Like I, I was, um, I re it was, I think when I when I read um, Catcher in the Rye, I decided that I was going to write that book. That I was going to write a book um, with a voice similar to that. You know, just just someone telling a story about someone that young telling what they felt, and I I just felt so good when I read that book that I wanted to be able to make other people feel as good and as understood. And I think that was it. People say that you catch uh, the, the the lingo of a generation mm -hmm. in a book like that. Would you agree with that? That 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 nobody wrote like that before. That that, that they tended to use uh, sort of uh, I don't know international Dominican dialect, <laughs> and that uh, and, and that you wrote a book that sounded li a lot like the way a pe people from your generation sound. I guess it's, it has to do with what I talked about earlier, the whole reference, the whole cultural pop, um, popular culture um, influence. Like, I, I guess the Dominican writing, uh, um, when my book came out, was, and still is, very formal and in a very provincial way. So maybe because it looks at literature only. <laughs> And I was looking at other stuff. I was looking at songs. I was looking at soap operas. I was looking at my friends, how they talked, you know. And if I'm going to write a dialogue, I'm not going to write. I'm not going to change their voices, you know. This is who they are and how, how I wanted to my characters to, to talk. So I was just listening. Tell us about Puppy. Uh... What is it that made you write a book like that? Um, well, basically, my father, um, it's a book about my father. <laughs> um, he died, he was um, shot in the Bronx in 1989, and I was 12. And he was a, a very important person in my life. And I hadn't thought much about it, and I hadn't thought much about what it meant that he was shot and what it meant for me and for and just 
everything, you know, like how, what changed inside of me and what changed, what, what the world was made into after that happened. And I went to Norway uh, a year before I wrote the book and I saw Scarface for the second time. I had seen it like when I was 10 or 9 or something. And I saw that movie and I said, hey, this is my dad. <laughs> this mm -hmm. Horrible uh, estereotipo, but it was him, you know. I, I could see his suits, I could see his car, the way he talked, the way he acted. And probably he was just imitating this so it's like a, it's like a loop mm -hmm. uh, a loop thing of performances and uh, I just said that was like that triggered something in my head about mm -hmm. how we perform this um, heroes or how we perform this characters and that's you know like the tragedy of my dad was he was you know the el, el macho uh, por excelencia. And that's what I wanted Puerto to Rico, do. Puerto Rico, we use the word bichote. Sí. Do you have a word like that in the Dominican Republic? El matatán. El matatán, El matatán. El matatán. El matatán. yeah. And, the, I, of course, I didn't want to make it into another Latin American epic, which I don't think mm -hmm. I escaped, but <laughs> I wanted to give the, the little girl uh, the voice. Um, and I was in Ithaca, and I knew that Nabokov had written his Lolita in Ithaca, so it was kind of like mm. a little blip. A little bit of a homage. Yeah. So I gave the girl the, the privilege. <laughs> Which she doesn't have in Nabokov's. Uh, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting you, uh, what you mentioned about your father, because I, when I read it, of course I'm thinking of Trujillo, you mm -hmm. know, in a way. Uh, but I also thought of the figure of the, the stereotypical, you know, the what the cadenu, mm -hmm. you know, the Dominican immigrant who goes to the U.S. to make his fortune selling drugs or whatever, comes back with the big gold chains mm -hmm. and the suits and um, and how also society, Dominican society, ex expects you know, something back from yeah. that Dominicano ausente who yeah. left and is coming back with, mm -hmm. you know, all this money now. So I found it very um, interesting, it's like more like a criticism of that Dominicano who leaves the country, but also of the masses of the Dominican society. So yeah. I don't know. Well, it's kind of I, like, I, I think there? all the, not all of them, but a lot of different masculinities can mm -hmm. be found there, even in the little girl. So mm -hmm. that one's definitely the mm -hmm. nucleus, el cadenu. <laughs> Even in the little girl, I find that very interesting in the novel, as a matter of fact. The, the relationship between the narrative voice mm -hmm. and, and the father, particularly because one senses sort of seduction there yeah. of, 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 the, of the father's uh, image. How, how do you feel about that? Um, there is a moment in in the book when she, after her dad is um, the little girl's dad is killed, and she's seen the body, and she says that it's not the body; it's a robot. Mm -hmm. She's running, and then she, some cousins of her pick her up, and they tell her that your dad is not dead, and it's kind of like a dreamlike sequence. She she says, "I'm I am my father," mm -hmm. and. It's kind of a little bit of trying to embrace those brutal masculinities and subverting them, you know, through your own body and how painful and how magical at the same time that process can be. And it's, it's just definitely, for me, if that book is anything, it's, um, it's a spiritual quest, <laughs> you know. Are there any type of readings of a novel like that that you would hate if it happened, you know, that the novel were read <laughs> in, a given, in a given way? Because it's such a, uh, you know, the type of book that lends itself to a certain kind of reading. Have you ever thought about that? I don't think I would hate any reading. You know, every person's entitled to their own reading, and if they do a poor reading of the book, then they're poor, and I'm sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I don't, 
I'm not bothered, you know, by any sort of reading. Just some people are a little bit more um, perceptive and smart and quick, you know, and can like really um, get in there, get in that car, um, and do the ride that I was that I intended uh, them to to go for. Um, and there's a lot to be seen in there. Mm -hmm. so, but if they can't do that, if they can just see one side of it, then... The Electrategia de Chochueca, as well as Papi, that whole dichotomy between virtual reality mm -hmm. uh, and non-virtual reality, whatever that is these days, <laughs> uh, is very sort of central. Uh, how does that a function in, 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 in with you? Is that something that you very much want to put at the forefront as, a, as an artist? I'm, I'm really, I really like uh, the road. I really love the road. It's the place where I like uh, to hear music. Like, I love to hear music in a car and just go, you know, for a drive for like three hours or whatever. And when I get there, I'm like, Let's go back. <laughs> uh -huh. So, and that you can see that I, I, I love to travel and in my head <laughs> too. So it's it's in my writing. And Chuchueca is more of um, a, a traveling of that truck with those the things that the, the speakers in the back, um, which are someone described them as a marcapasos de la postmodernidad. ¿Cómo se dice marcapasos? Look at the pointing. You know what it is. I, I know exactly, but I don't know okay. the word. <laughs> Whatever they put on your chest when you have problems with your heart. Quiero marcar porque esas dos bocinas in the back of the truck were como marca pasos. Um, and it's it's very uh, claustrophobic in the that it's just describing kind of like circles inside of the city and. Mm -hmm. And in Papi, it's more of the whole, the, the whole country, and I would say like the, the Latin American masculinity landscape, you know, and it's, it's, it's also another loop, another like traveling experience. And it, I always, it had, there's a part in Papi that I uh, wrote to be like, um, like instructions for a video game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's in Chochueca, and it's also in Papi, that whole like, mm -hmm. um, the whole thing about the the quest, you know, that you go, you you pass um, a stage through a series of rituals, and then you go through another mm -hmm. um, another stage, and so and so, so you reach your final monster. <laughs> so do you play a lot of video games? <laughs> I don't actually, but there's some things that just I do, but no, I'm not like a fan. Um, but there's some things that are just within your your culture. I mean, your best friend uh, might be a, a video game fan, and you, and you, you you don't play as much as he does, but you put that in your writing. So, and let's talk a, a, a little bit about Puerto Rico and how did you come about discovering Puerto Rico? Uh, we know that you are very much a presence there. You go there with some regularity, and you have managed to. Get yourself a space, I would say. Uh, how is Puerto Rico a part of your landscape? Um, it, uh, it was after I published my first novel, I self published it in the DR, and after it was done, I didn't do another, um, what do you say, otra tirada. Mm -hmm. And, but it managed to. I say it managed because I didn't do anything about it. <laughs> it started to move like from hand to hand, and it reached certain professors um, in the form of photocopies. And these professors tr they were trying to get the, the the actual like book, but they couldn't find it, so they started teaching it um, in this way. <laughs> and one of these professors is Juan Luchesne, who is has been very loyal to my work, if I might say that. It's a very um, special friend of mine. And he started like just giving this book to everyone because he really liked it. And I was lucky enough that other people were interested in the book and started to 
they, they wanted to know more about me, and they invited me to Puerto Rico and then uh, Isla Negra, which is a, a publishing house that has uh, the right for Chochueca, published the novel. And, and then I went back to do a, to teach a, a creative writing workshop. And, but it's, it's really, it's interesting how a lot of, like half of the relationships I have there have been developed through the internet. Like after, like I would go there and then I would go back and then like 20 people would write me and from those 20 people like some of them would be interested in bringing me back for a special something a reading or or something or an interview or um, just people that were interested in knowing where they could get my other books or and every time and there's I've made like very good friendships and contacts like every time I go there and the thing is that I've found a more like in the DR, I'm more there. There's an adult crowd that goes to my to my performance um, things and, and my readings and all that and my book presentations. But it's mostly a, a young crowd. The the majority of the people that go to my um, presentations. But in the in Puerto Rico, it's like it's more uh, diverse. The crowd is more diverse because it started the opposite way. It was not like the young people that started to read me, like in the DR, in the in Puerto Rico, it was the the professors were the ones that were first interested in my work. How would you compare the two islands now that you that you have lived and stayed in both places and go back and forth? Well, definitely Puerto Rico has, um, there's more space for certain things. I mean, there's, there's, I feel there's more freedom. Um, I feel a lot safer there as, as a homosexual. And I feel there's more, there's more receptivity towards cer certain um, ways of, of creating and of, articulating your ideas like the, I think the the fact that it's been the Puerto Rico has been linked to the American uh, tradition uh, the American academia it, it, it has it's been good in a way because it's been of ha hecho que la que la que Puerto Rico permanezca de alguna manera ese contacto hace que 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 o sea haya un un tránsito de ideas mucho más ágil que, que nosotros no, no, no tuvimos ni tenemos todavía. Eh, ni en la academia, ni en las artes, ni en nada, ni en la literatura. Um, we've been very uh, isolated mm -hmm. en, en, en ese sentido y es un, es, básicamente es una, una Es como un círculo vicioso provinciano eh, en el que lo que es muy, 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 muy diferente, no se entiende, no puede, no penetra, no puede eh, formar parte. Y cuando forma parte, es de una y cuando es, se integra, es de una manera muy superficial o, o, porque, o porque es parte de un trend o, o algo así. O sea que... I remember a conversation we had uh, some time ago where you, you mentioned that as far as tourism is concerned, uh, Puerto Rican tourism is very American oriented, whereas Dominican tourism was more European oriented. And as a result, there was some sort of European presence in the Dominican Republic that you missed in, in, in Puerto Rico. How, how do you feel that differentiates both spaces? Um, eso Es una, yo lo entiendo como una ventaja. Um, the fact that we, not just tourism, but also a lot of social workers, like uh, people from NGOs that go to the DR from not just um, Europe, but also Latin America um, and the United States too. Um, a lot of young people and young adults that, for the the nature of the work they do, have a very special uh, view of, of life and have brought good things into, I think more, more than the, the work, the institutional work they do, they've done more good 
with just being there, you know, and, and being in, it, there's people that provide a conceptual uh, freedom just by being somewhere, you know, and being able to have a conversation, like ha making you, giving you the space to have a conversation with them about things that you, maybe you can't talk to mm -hmm. people that are from your own country, you know, like just, maybe just about a song, you know, or, or an idea or, so I think it's definitely, it has been good, and it has been good in ways that um, I would, there's stuff that didn't get there, and this happens in Cuba too, but it happens just as much in the DR, like we would, we don't get, um, there's a lot of magazines that we don't get, there's a lot of music that we, uh, that doesn't, that never gets there, and these people bring those things, and the, it's information, and, and this is what art is made of, and mm -hmm. So it's been, it's, it's kind of like a, um, like the, in the time of the pirates, you know, it's just a, a, a very, uh, an alternative, una ruta alternativa de mercancía necesaria que llega, no por la, por el canal establecido, sino de, de mano en mano, mm -hmm. o, por, o por otra vía. When you go to Puerto Rico, are you aware of the Dominican presence in the island? How do you feel it? Um, it's, there's very, it's very diverse actually, the, the, the Dominican community, because I've been in touch with, uh, kids that are, that are in the university that come from a upper middle class background, I've been, I've been, been in touch with people that are just, you know, that just got off the uh, Yola mm -hmm. <laughs> in Mayagüez that, you know, that have, still have sand on them and just telling me their stories and how they've crossed El Canal de la Mona seven times, and and if they they're sent back, they're gonna come again, and so it's it's very it's, there's so many different narratives in in the whole Dominican um, community in, in Puerto Rico, um, but most of I, I haven't as like I haven't been in touch with Dominicans as much as I would like to when I go there. Um, and I would definitely, the thing that I do see is that the ones that are workers and that are, um, you know, not necessarily in the, the best um, position are, son, están tan marginalizados como los haitianos en, en Santo Domingo. Y de una, o sea, es brutal, brutal. O sea, es, and it's something that you can see in, and you can feel, and it has nothing to do with the way someone is dressed or if they have money in their pocket or not. It's just like a, uh, the, you know, it's, it's really, it's very overwhelming for me, you know, to, to see that and just to understand that. And because I've been, because in New York where, uh, also uh, part of uh, una minoría y en España where I lived to, I lived in Madrid for five months there was also another there's a, a big community over there too but the community in Puerto Rico is very I don't know maybe because we're so close maybe because we're so similar mm -hmm. and then the difference has to be uh, made more in a more drastic way you know you have to push these people in a more drastic way to make them into the other and because we're so alike that we don't you know we don't want to be the same so this is something you, that you're still processing it seems that you haven't come yeah, to terms with a little bit <laughs> <laughs> do you consider yourself now a permanent resident of New York or is New York a step in your uh, road trip it's a step <laughs> I love New York. I love New York, and I love the people there, and I love all the things you can do when you over there. But I don't think I'm going to live my whole life there. Mm -hmm. And it's the city where my dad died, so I have like mm -hmm. my my issues <laughs> about it. You know, sometimes I feel mm -hmm. like I have a like that. You know, my family mm -hmm. has dropped blood on this soil. I have a right <laughs> to be in this place. Uh, or if, other mornings I wake like, what, am, what the hell am I doing here? Or, mm -hmm. you know, but it, it's a beautiful, beautiful city and 
I feel right at home. So, is your role as a mother part of your self-image as an artist? Not at all, um, and it's something because motherhood is something that I've embraced. Like my son is eight years old, but motherhood is something that took me a long time to to embrace and and actually understand the meaning of it and how important it was and how it, what the things it did for me and it, just like, I don't know, I guess I'm a little bit slow <laughs> when it comes to uh, realizing the, the impact that things have on me and I don't know, for, for some reason I just, I, I was dealing with a lot of things when I had my child and with my own sexuality and I hadn't come out and I just had everything came together so I was it was kind of like my my creative work and that the you know the whole coming out thing were in one side and then my my son was in another and it's like it's like Batman and Bruce Wayne you know <laughs> a little bit I'm trying to make them um, blend <laughs> now you know more a less uh, schizophrenic <laughs> um, way of life, I guess. Now, seeing it from the point of view, say, of a homosexual woman, uh, how do you feel about this turn, recent turn, in gay culture uh, where motherhood, uh, fatherhood, family building has become a particularly central aspect of gay politics? since you are a mother yourself, uh, how would you, how, how do you see it? Well, I think in my particular case is, I think it's, it would be a lot healthier for a kid, in this case my son, to be able to grow up in a society where he's not going to be beaten up because his mom is with another woman. And that's as simple as saying that shirt is white, you know, it's not a very hard thing. And uh, I just, I think that we're, we're getting somewhere and there's a lot of work to do and el bien siempre triunfa, is <laughs> me. You're an optimist. Sí. <laughs> is he living with you in, the, in New York right now? No, he lives with his dad and uh, he's, he lived with me till he was, uh, two and his dad is also an artist so we kind of for a long time he was his dad would go on tour to play and he would stay with me or I would have to go for a couple months he would stay with his dad but then when I moved to New York City he stayed with his dad I was with him this summer though now, since we're conducting this interview at the Latino Center <laughs> would you consider yourself a Latina writer why not <laughs> Why not? <laughs> um, I guess you did go back and forth when you were young, yeah. right? So, yeah, that's, that's really... Um, but, I guess, Latinos... What is a Latino? Uh, Someone that has I guess you two experiences that. of language and culture when, yeah, I'm one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we can, you know, maybe make it more strict, saying that I was born here or that I would, came when I was two. Mm -hmm. No, but. What do you see yourself doing? Right now? <laughs> yeah, as an artist. Um, I, I don't know. I, I really wish I can uh, write that great book that I want to write someday and that I, that I am able to articulate certain things that have been in my mind since I was a kid and I've been trying to articulate in the books I've written mm -hmm. um, and just to have time to do it all, you know, to, mm -hmm. to do all those things I want to me. <laughs> you want to talk a little bit about your current project, the novel you're working on right now? Yeah. Uh, um, okay. 
Nombres para Animales, uh, it's, a, it's a book about another coming of age novel. <laughs> it seems like that's my specialty. Um, it's a book about this uh, teenager who works at a vet hospital for a summer. And I'm dealing with, it's kind of like the post poppy book, you know, dealing with mourning and all these animals that come to die at the hospital or to be brought back to life and the different relations with with adults, like relationships between adults and, and children. Gracias, Rita. Okay. Thank you so Gracias much. Gracias a ustedes. <laughs>